Hi, uh, welcome to Talks at Google. Um, today, we have a guest named Claire Saffitz, uh, who's going to be talking about her new book, What's for Dessert? Simple Recipes for Dessert People. Um, so, and here's Claire. Uh, oh, hi. So <laughs> if you uh, aren't familiar with Claire, she is formerly from Bon Appetit magazine and the Bon Appetit YouTube channel. Uh, she runs and cooks on the YouTube channel Dessert Person, and she has two books, Dessert Person and this new one, What's for Dessert. Um, so I thought I'd start out by asking, what makes someone a dessert person? What exactly is a dessert person? I think I am one, but I'd like to hear your definition. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think on the simplest level, it's someone who appreciates sweet flavors and feels like you know, the meal isn't over until you've finished with something a little bit sweet. Um, but I also like to think of of dessert people and being a dessert person as like an attitude and a, and a frame of mind and kind of a way of moving through the world. So for me, it's about embracing the idea of food as pleasure and divorcing it from morality and um, just kind of like embracing, you know, the good things in life. So being a dessert person is kind of about like saying yes. And, um, and you know, I, I say in, in the introduction to dessert person, my first book, I talk about how like, you don't have to earn dessert. You don't have to feel guilty about eating it. Um, so th those are really important principles in my life. And I think that it's more it's its more than just an attitude or philosophy regarding food. It's sort of like a general approach to, to many different areas of my life as well. So it's, yeah, it's about that that embrace of, you know, kind of the, the sweet things in life generally. Cool. Uh, then yes, I definitely think I'm a dessert <laughs> person. Um, so since we're, Talks at Google, I wanted to first ask about uh, something in the book, which is uh, Googlers love graphs and organizing things into categories. And so you kind of start out with a nice graph called the recipe matrix, and then you go into your principles about what recipes you picked and uh, how you organize them and stuff. So um, I thought that was really cool and not something that I see in cookbooks a lot. Uh, could you talk more about um, why those things are important to you and also why you wanted to tell the readers about those things instead of just like using them yourself and leaving them hidden. Yeah, I mean the the you know the the beginning of every cookbook is the the term I'm publishing is like the front matter. It's like generally includes the same kinds of sections like an introduction and you know a a, a section on ingredients and equipment. It's like it's pretty boring. That I mean it's actually like a necessary information but it's kind of the same standard stuff that you see book to book. And so I wanted to but that's really the author's opportunity to explain to people like what is this book and you know how to use it and and what's important or different about it. So the recipe matrix is a very quick way of communicating a lot of information and so because it's important to me I as a recipe developer I understand that like I'm asking a lot of a home baker or cook when I you know when they agree to make a recipe. So I want to be really upfront about the time commitment, the effort the, the kind of overall buy-in for our recipe. So the recipe matrix is a very user-friendly way of locating exactly the level of recipe that is right for a person at any given time. So if, you know, for, just to describe it a little bit more in depth, it is, it basically plots every recipe on the book on two axes, on two axes. One is difficulty and one is time. So there are certain recipes that are really easy, but take a while because you might have to chill it overnight. So that you know that will be on one end of the of the of the matrix, and then there's the super quick, super easy recipes that are like in the bottom left corner, and then there are the more complicated recipes that take a little bit longer and will you know keep you in the kitchen for a couple hours, um, a little bit more of a project. And this is in both books. This is in Dessert Person and What's for Dessert. So it's a way of um, sort of allowing uh, the 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 home cook or baker to sort of quickly decide like what kind of recipe is right for them because no one's making these things in a vacuum no one has like unlimited time and and resources and so it's like you're always making something for an occasion or you know with a certain amount of time and um and ability and desire so that that was the idea behind that is like sort of um making it as easy as possible for for the, the user to to pick the recipe that's right for them and right for their circumstance um, and I and I was so popular in Dessert Person that I did it again in What's for Dessert, even though the recipes generally aren't as difficult and don't usually take you know quite as long, um, but it's still I think a really really helpful tool. Cool, uh, yeah, I like the the at a glance information. It's a lot better than just an index or right. 
Um, so the other thing I was wondering about is talking about the, the principles. So you said something a second ago, which was interesting, which is that your people are trusting you with these recipes that they're going to be able to get through them. Um, so I watched some of your YouTube show and you kind of have a very uh, informal relationship with the viewer and the camera people. And there's kind of a, like, people obviously haven't met you, but there's kind of like a friendliness and informality to it. So is that does that factor into why you decide to write out the principles and things like that? Yeah, I mean, communication is really important. And I, I generally err on the side of like giving more information rather than less. And so this book was really an attempt to reach the the truly novice home cook and home baker. Um, so, you know, there's so much kind of assumed knowledge in cookbooks when you if you tell someone like cream together butter and sugar. Not everyone's going to necessarily know what that means, even though that's intuitive to me because I've been doing it so long. Like these things are not um, second nature to a lot of people. So this book, this is this is what's for dessert. This book was really an attempt to um, sort of like leave no stone unturned when it came to explaining different techniques. And so I really took take the opportunity in the beginning of the book to explain sort of how I approach the recipes and because I, I advertise them as like, these are simple recipes. The subtitle is simple recipes for dessert people. And I want people to know what that means. So I explain sort of what my approach is. And even though a recipe might have several different components and, you know, take a little bit longer in the kitchen, it does, it can still be simple, I think. Um, so I really take that time to, to sort of explain my recipe principles about how, how I streamline them, how I, rely on store-bought ingredients whenever I can, you know, how I, there's no stand mixer required. It's just a hand mixer. Um, there's a little section about how I like my ingredients to work double time or work overtime. So it's like, if there's lemon juice in the recipe, I add the zest. It's, it's this idea of like sort of maximizing results with, with the, the, the least amount of effort. Um, so yeah, it's like, I, I feel like there's a contract that I have with with my viewers and with you know the home cooks who are making my recipes, it's like I want them to I want the recipes to turn out. I want them to have success, and I I want to I want to show them that I'm doing everything I can to to like help them get there. And I can't I can't always guarantee it. There's just always variables that I don't that I can't control. Something that's different in your kitchen than in my kitchen that's gonna you know could affect the outcome. But um, and that that informality to me is also just about like I want to be seen as a guide as as someone that's like helping people and um, making baking and pastry more accessible um and, and like less of an you know anxious pursuit so yeah i think all of it is in service of like reaching reaching people where they are and um you know kind of helping them guiding them through through this kind of journey of like being a better home baker cool um yeah i really want to talk more about the anxiety component uh, mostly because <laughs> i am an anxious person and an anxious baker sometimes but uh, let's talk about the kind of educational component first. Um, I know you say in the book that you have a long history of learning other people's recipes because you were a test kitchen person, um, test chef. I don't know what the, the right term is. Yeah, but, uh, I, I, we were, our term was food editors, but yes, I, I worked in the test kitchen as a, as a recipe tester. Um, so you've been teaching people recipes both in your book and on YouTube. Could you talk a little bit about the difference between having to write out directions and like pick one picture to represent things versus having live video the whole time and what's different between the two? Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about this. So, you know, the written recipe format, I mean, everyone's used to like a written recipe. That's how people learn, how people make things. That is the format, um, but it has its limits. And so I've, I've long been a recipe writer. I first learned how to write recipes as first a tester in the test kitchen. So when I first, worked at, started Bon Appetit, that was my job. I was the person, I wasn't developing recipes, so I wasn't creating recipes. I was given recipes created by others to, you know, to test. And basically I was the last, like, I, I was the last defense against um, like errors or inconsistencies in the recipe. So that was my job to make sure that everything worked and, um, you know, turned out and, um, and all the times were correct or everything like that. So that's how I learned how to write a recipe by reading other people's recipes and learning like, oh, this, this was really helpful or this what this is an interesting way to describe this step or, you know, this is really descriptive language, that kind of thing. Um, and that's a, was a great education in the craft of recipe writing. Um, and I'm also just a reader of cookbooks. So that's helpful as well. And then when it, 
you know, and I, my own evolution as a recipe writer has, you know, is still ongoing. So I'm always striving to improve my recipe writing. Um, I do come from a writing background, so I think that helps a lot. It, and it is a very different kind of writing, but I still think having, having, you know, strong writing skills helps. So I've, I've kind of worked out a format for recipe writing that works for me, where I, I like to have steps with a header at the beginning, so which tells you what you're going to do in that step, because rather than, I mean, I, they're still numbered, but like rather, you know, I, I think that that's helpful because when you see a big block of text on a page, it can be very intimidating and it can be difficult mm -hmm. to kind of like enter that process because you're just a little bit overwhelmed by the words. And also I like to use a lot of words. Like I, I like to give, I don't just say like bake until the cake is done. I'll say bake until the cake is golden brown across the surface springy to the touch in the center and a cake tester inserted into the center comes out clean. So I, again, like over, I kind of over deliver because I'm trying to give the reader all the tools that I possibly can uh, to succeed, but it can mean that the recipes like are long. Um, so I think that the header at the beginning is a really helpful tool because you can kind of just read those and you can think to yourself, okay, like I understand the basic steps here. It's, I'm going to mix the dry ingredients. I'm going to mix the wet ingredients. I'm going to mix them together and then I'm going to bake it. So it's like, these are all sort of things that I've thought about over, over, you know, several years. And, and after writing two books that I, I kind of rely on as, um, you know, like little, uh, I think sort of helpful aspects of the form, but to answer your actual question about like, written, you know, print versus video, um, video is a better tool for teaching in so many ways. Like with a, with a written recipe, you have to pick a path. Like you have to declare a path. You have to have a way of getting from start to finish in a recipe. And it's not necessarily reflective of how cooking actually works, which is that like often there's more than one way to get to that end point. Um, actually in, in what's for dessert, I have a choose your own ending recipe, which is kind of fun. It's like a, was a, a way of like playing with that format a little bit where it's, you can either make creme brulee or you can make creme caramel. So it's like the same recipe, but just with different, like a couple different choices along the way. Um, so I do like to play with that format a little bit, but video is so much more flexible. Obviously it's visual, like cooking is, is, is uh you know sensorial process all around it there's like you know hearing and tasting and listening and smelling and, and of course seeing but video is just it's such a an amazing complementary tool for for written recipes because i can show you like okay like the recipe says this but like it's really fine if you do you know this you know the recipe says a but you can really do b or c and, that, and that's okay too but here's what's going to happen so i like doing both um and they're, they are very different but I think that they work together really well. And so it's nice that I have the book and then I have the, the companion YouTube series because that's where I can show off a little bit more flexibility. Sorry, that was a very long answer, but, but no, I thought a lot good. about it. <laughs> um, yeah, as a anxious baker, um, I tend to have the recipe like right next to me while I'm doing stuff. And every step I recheck, like, oh, did I remember all the things and did I measure <laughs> right? So yeah, the section right. headers and having the little asides are very helpful to someone like me who's maybe not that competent in remembering <laughs> the right parts. Um, but you're right that having YouTube, it's harder to scrub back and forth and like say, oh, I'm on this part, like what am I gonna do here? But seeing how things come together, uh, like, there's no real way to do that in print, so it's. Yeah, I mean, I it was really important to me that all of the recipes have a photo in the book because if there's no photo and you don't know how it's supposed to look at the end, like, <laughs> my own likelihood of making something is very low. So that just having the visual of even just the finished thing is so helpful. And there's often steps throughout a recipe where it's like, it's helpful for me as a recipe developer. I watch YouTube videos all the time of people making recipes to sort of see like, what did their dough look like? Or, you know, how does their, um, you know, what, what's the consistency of their, of that batter, that, that kind of thing. So, um, the, you know, but the photo only goes so far. And I have lots of step-by-step -step photos in the book to also to try to kind of walk people through that process. But video is still, video will always be be able to communicate more than than photographs. Yeah, I really appreciated um, the techniques section at the back where you kind of laid out common things, maybe in more detail, uh, since they're going to come up over and over again. Yeah, I, I did a lot of thinking about Dessert Person after it came out and how that book was received. And I, I really, and the kinds of questions that I would get from people about the recipes. And I would kind of realize that like, oh, I think I need to actually take a step back and explain in depth some of these techniques and concepts for baking that to me seem kind of simple. Like I mentioned earlier, like creaming together 
um, butter and sugar if you're making a cake, for example. Um, these are things that are not necessarily like well understood in the, in the general population. And you know, for first time bakers or people who are just starting out, th this book is really, What's for Dessert is really where I take a step back and break down like lots of common concepts and, and techniques um, in, that are that a recipe might call for, you know, but not explain. I might say like fold these two things together. It's like, well, what is folding? What does that really mean? And so I that's mm -hmm. actually that's where this photo came from on the on the cover. Is like this is was we shot this photo during the process of showing what folding means, which is that it's like a gentle method of mixing where you're using a spatula and you have a big bowl and you're combining two mixtures, usually one of which is like very light and airy. So it's a way of preserving air at, you know, whether it's whipped cream or beaten egg whites. And so it's, you know, you're taking what's on the bottom of the bowl and you're bringing it to the top. And it's like, there's actually a lot to explain with that concept, but it can be used so um, casually in, in recipe, like fold together. So it's like, okay, so what does that mean? So that was the attempt in this book was to really break things down and explain. And I think that it's helpful. It's, it's, and, and not just for novices. I think it's, you know, it's always useful to, to have that as a reference. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've seen some older cookbooks like my grandma's era that like step one is make creme anglaise and it's right. just assumed that you know what that means. Totally, that's so interesting. So I did my master's in like food history. Um, oh, cool. And I did a lot of reading of old cookbook texts. I mean, old being like from the early modern era, like 1600s and 1700s. And they were as a form, it came out of the form of the household manual and which was like so it, and it was a writ, the you know first cookbooks were written by professional chefs who worked for like noble or royal families and wrote the books for other professional chefs to explain to them like how to how to fulfill that role and so the earliest cookbooks will say exactly like that i'll say like make a stiff meringue bake it in a in a hot oven in a well-made pastry crust like that kind of, you know what i mean so it's like yeah. it, there is that assumed knowledge because it's written by professionals for other professionals. But of course now like cookbooks are for everyone. And I wanted to really make them make this book as accessible as I possibly could. So that idea of thinking about audience is also really important with, with when writing a recipe. And I decided for this book that like I was going to be writing for the most general audience possible. Um, you know, which obviously like, I want to sell the most amount of books that I can. So that makes sense in a, in a lot of different reasons. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's also something that uh, not a lot of cookbooks try to do, despite everyone wanting to sell the most books, um, <laughs> just because it, it takes, I, I guess, a lot of time and effort to really spell everything out and page count and stuff. So Yes, yes. Page count was a, a topic of discussion for both books. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I had to cut stuff, but generally, like, you know, it's, it's a pretty big book and, and both books are pretty long. So I was generally able to get everything in there that I wanted to, which is you know, not a lot of authors can say, so I've been lucky. Cool. Um, I wanted to move on to anxiety related stuff, but first I wanted to ask, uh, since you have this test kitchen history, um, is there any time in particular you can think of where like you wanted to make something in a recipe and just it was really confusing or the technique was really weird and then eventually you got it? Because uh, I think that's maybe an experience a lot of people have had, but like it was my own idea for a recipe that uh, I was trying no, to No, just something you wanted to cook, but you had trouble following the recipe. And then because you are a skilled mm. chef, you figured out what was going on. I'm trying to think. That's a great question. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, there are certain things where because a lot of the books that I use, a lot of the recipes that I use if, um, are like professional tools. So it might be, and I have a lot of cookbooks as references. So I have like the cookbook that I, it's not really a cookbook, it's more of a textbook really, uh, that I used in culinary school um, in France. And I have, my husband went to Culinary Institute of America. So I have his like little textbooks from, you know, when mm -hmm. he was in culinary school and did, did the whole education. So those are, I mean, it's a different kind of resource than just like the average recipe written for a popular audience um, that you might find in a magazine or online. So, but that doesn't mean that there's not necessarily information. Again, it's a thick question of audience. It's like they know that they're writing this for students and people learning right. and people who might be running a restaurant and that kind of thing. So you have to sort of understand that as you're reading it. But there's definitely parts of recipes that I 
I, I just, I keep thinking of like making brioche or something. It's the kind of thing where you could still follow a recipe exactly. And even if they're step-by-step -step photos, but there is sort of an X factor where when you're making it, and I guess this is more common for bread making where you have the added variable of yeast and temperature and everything like that. Mm -hmm. But you kind of just have to make it a million times. Like there's things that you, that you have to just learn from practice and repetition that you'll never be able to learn from reading a recipe, even if you read the recipe five times or that kind of thing. So um, in these sort of more technical types of recipes or more elaborate recipes where there's so many different variables, I do think that it's so much more about practice than it is about the recipe. And so I tell people, people often ask me, how do I get to be a better baker? And I say to them, pick a few things that you really love eating or that you want to learn how to make and make them over and over and over again. And you sort of gain an intuition, you get a kind of like sense memory and muscle memory for making it. And you start to observe important nuances in the recipe. Like those are the things that you can never really, you can try to communicate in a written recipe, but it really is about the 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 repetition and the kind of observations of the maker that 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 will, you know, it's always going to be a little bit different, basically. Hmm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's also hard because we see so many new things to try. I know, all the time, I know, but... I know. It's it's tough to resist. Like you know, there's so much food media, and there's so many, so much beautiful food photography that's so enticing, and so it's very tempting to want to constantly like move on to the, the next new recipe. But I do encourage people like build build a bit of a repertoire, you know, build build your own library of recipes that are kind of tried and true, and and go from there. Makes sense. Um, so uh, part of the title is simple recipes, and there's a section in the book about how to bake with less anxiety. Uh, which I think ties in well to what you were just saying about baking media. So there is a lot of media fo focused on baking disasters or decorating disasters. And even the stuff that's pretty upbeat, like Great British Bake Off, there's always, well, something failed and it's probably due to humidity or something. We don't know why, but you just have to keep going or start over or whatever. Um, so uh, do you think that there's anything people need to... Uh, keep in mind when they go into baking a new recipe to kind of keep them from being scared? I, I, I do try to manage expectations, actually. I think that can be in some ways the most helpful tool for, for beginning bakers is to understand that, and food media is partly to blame for this. It's like, it's so, there's so many photos of, you know, beautiful food styling and, um, and those are made by professionals and, hopefully most of the time it's a true representation of the recipe. It's, it's, you know, as advertised, but sometimes it's not, sometimes it's, you know, there's a trick here and there. I've seen things like it's not, it's not whipped cream. It's like whipped topping, which looks very different. And, you know, you can, yeah. it's sort of more, you know, more uh, like you can manipulate it more. And so I, I, I try to manage people's expectations around achieving what the photo looks like, like, and also, and that, and I don't, I don't mean it in a bad way. I mean that like there's many different ways to measure success. And if your only measure of success is that it looks exactly like the photo, then like you might be disappointed a great, you know, a great majority of the time. And that's, and I don't think that that's the right way of looking at things. So I fail in the kitchen all the time. Things don't turn out. Um, it's usually because I'm taking some kind of sh uh, shortcut that I shouldn't, like I'm rushing or something doesn't cool totally or it's a thousand degrees in my kitchen, which is like, that's a regular occurrence. Um, so, but I learned so much from those mistakes. And I know it's a cliche to say like, you learn more from your uh, failures than from your successes, but it's completely true in baking. Yeah, there's and, a reason for it. Yeah, I mean, that's where, when something turns out, you don't always know why it turned out, like it just does. But when you, something goes wrong, it's like, I can usually tell what, what, you know, where, where things kind of veered off course. So I basically try to say like, look, your measure of success should be, did, did it taste good? And did you enjoy sharing it with, you know, pe the people around you? And, and that should be enough to maybe like at least make it again or, or try again if you were, you know, if something didn't quite go the way that you wanted it to. So I think managing expectations is really important and to also kind of reframe baking and the pursuit of, 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 you know, home, home cooking and home baking as a process and as like a long game. And it's not, 
like, I think that the measure of success is like, are you getting better? Or do you enjoy it? Are you like, you know, cooking for people who are also enjoying it? All it's not just about one's that the measure of success is not just about that one singular recipe in so many ways. So I try to basically encourage people to like have a long perspective. Um, you know, don't, don't get, try not to give up. It, it's normal to get frustrated, but like try again, you know, if something didn't work. So that's a big part of it. And then I give actually like practical tips, you know, that are more almost like some, some psychological, some practical in the book about how to, how to be less anxious when, when you bake, because I remember, I remember the anxiety of, you know, I mean, I still have, you know, I still get anxious times. Like, is this going to turn out? Um, and that's a nerve wracking feeling. So I try to assuage that anxiety um, for, for home bakers in that section. Yeah, I should mention that uh, I tried to make the persimmon panna cotta over the weekend because we had a bunch of extra persimmons. And it was a, one of the first times I've used gelatin to cook oh. with it. It didn't set, but it was really delicious. And oh, no. my children were obsessed with it and were like making the bowls clean. So uh, I think I just fun. didn't use enough Jello, but uh, yeah, it was really good. So I'll I definitely see. try it again. Yeah, I mean, some gelatin can be tricky. It has to be like fully dissolved, which is sometimes not like it takes some like real powers of perception to see if there's no more granules like after it's mm -hmm. melted. But yeah, I would say like try again. At least you got to eat it. You know, I think in unless your failure is so is such that like you have to throw it out like i never want that to be an outcome but as you know as long as you can find some way to like at least consume it and enjoy it then it's like okay that's you know that there, there's enough there that i think you should just there's enough of a reason yeah. there to try again yeah and it's uh it's great that you have a bunch of recipes that you can't burn because that's one of the main ways <laughs> i've ruined things is uh just a little too inattentive and then the bottom's yes. burnt or... yes for sure um, so you mentioned that you've had a, a bunch of things that didn't turn out right. Are there any notable baking disasters you want to share? I, mean, I haven't, I, I'm kind of at the point where it's like, I don't have any, well, I was gonna say, I don't really have any disasters. I'm sure that's not true. Um, I don't really have any disasters, but I have in my own recipe testing, sometimes I come up with an idea that I think it feels really creative and it feels new and like something I haven't seen before and I test it. And it just doesn't work. Like when I'm testing a recipe, the first thing I'm sort of looking for it in, in the first test or the first couple of tests, it's like proof of concept. It's like, does this idea basically work? And sometimes the answer is no. And sometimes I'll test it two, but maybe three, maybe four times to try to get it to work because I'm really committed to the idea. And at that point I have to just say, it's like, I don't have endless time and resources to, to make something work and to test it, you know, by testing it 50 times. It's like, I, you know, I don't work for like modernist, I'm not Harold McGee, you know, I'm not working for like mo modernist cuisine. So um, it's just me in my kitchen at home and I don't like wasting ingredients. So there are times where I have to scrap a recipe because it's like for three tries, if this isn't what I want it to be and and I'm not having success and I kind of got to, I have to kick it to the curb. So I had, a, there was an idea that I had in the book because I have a whole section on, um, a whole chapter on stovetop desserts. So <laughs> things like puddings and rice pudding and custards that you can, you don't need an oven to make them. Um, and I have some flambe recipes, so like things you set on fire in the stovetop. And one idea I had for a recipe for that chapter was grape. I love like, I don't know, I love conquer grapes. It was grapes flambe, like a flaming, mm. like grapes set a flame on that the stovetop. That sounds good. Well, and I wanted to do it with grappa. Like I, I thought it was just be like a fun sort of variation on Cherry's Jubilee. But it didn't work like the grapes burst and they got really pulpy and they didn't hold their shape and it was sort of like oh that's why this isn't a thing that's why this doesn't exist so that's an important lesson um that you know sometimes something isn't a recipe for a reason um <laughs> so i i've had so many experiences like that where it's like i have an idea for a thing and it's not like it i guess I, I don't even necessarily look at it as a failure. It's just that the, the end result is not what I want it to be. You know, that that's often um, the case. So maybe failure is even like a harsh way of looking at it. It's more that like the outcome was just not what I wanted it to be. And so, you know, then I, then I just decided to move on. Yeah, that makes sense. And then, you know, this technique doesn't work with these things, but maybe right. a different variant. Right. Or... But I learned a lot from that. It was like, oh, the thing that I, you know, whatever you are flambéing stovetop, like, it helps if it's low moisture. It helps if, you know, it's a little bit drier. Like I learned a lot about what makes something. And also like when I was 
sorry, this is maybe not interesting, but like I thought it was interesting when I was, so I was making these grapes and I was cooking them very hot on the stove and they were releasing a lot of liquid. And then when you flambe something and you add alcohol to, to the skillet, mm -hmm. if there's a lot of moisture in the skillet, then it's quickly diluting the alcohol and it's not, and it's kind of like blending into the thing, into the, you know, what's in the pan. And it's not going to give you a dramatic flame. So it's like, you have to have, I learned in the process of like, you know, this, like when you flambe something, you have to have a really dry pan. Otherwise you're not going to have this kind of dramatic effect. So that was like, you know, I learned a lot from that and it made my other recipes better because I was able to give tips for like, I have a, I have a little kind of mini essay in the book of like tips for safe, deep frying and, and flambeing at home. So it was really helpful. And then I just moved on, you know, yeah. that, that recipe never made it. Well, sounds like a good experience <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I um, made a lot of grape jam because I had all this like pulpy grape. Well, that's like, good stuff. Basically compote. Yeah. It, it, I mean, I don't, I don't waste ingredients, so it just becomes mm -hmm. something else. Um, so kind of related to that, I wanted to ask, was there anything that, uh, you thought was like a big hit or you really enjoyed eating, but once you got it in front of other people, they were like, uh, I don't know about this or maybe not for the book. Like, let's, let's not do this one. Um, it's, it's interesting. I think, I mean, my husband is usually the one who's like, I don't know about this. He's a very fair, but tough critic. Um, there were some recipes in dessert person that my editor was like, I don't think this belongs in the book. It wasn't, it's not usually a matter of taste. I mean, sometimes someone tastes a recipe and it's just a flavor that's not for them, which is normal. And I don't take that personally. It's just everyone has their yeah. own tastes. Um, it was more the idea that the recipes have to kind of tell a story and be of a piece and speak to one another. And so in Dessert Person, my editor would look at the table of contents and she like flagged a couple recipes. I was like, I don't think this should be in here. You know, I don't. And, and at first... I'm so attached to my recipe. So I was like, oh, like, oh, come on, you know, like I'll keep them. And then I realized she was right. Um, so the, I remember this happened in the savory. There's a savory chapter in Dessert Person. So what's for dessert is all dessert across mm -hmm. the board. But uh, Dessert Person has some savory stuff in it. And I remember she flagged stuff from that chapter and was like, this just doesn't feel like it fits with everything else. It was, it was so... I don't know. I don't know how to describe it exactly, but it was just sort of this like qualitative thing that, and I, and she was right. So that has been more of the conversation. I think when pe people are not generally going to tell me like, I don't like this thing that you made. Um, but one of my, one of my, um, cause people are trying to be very kind and, and mm -hmm. don't want to hurt my feelings. But one thing I've noticed is like, I usually look to see what people eat first. So I, I share a lot of recipes with my neighbors and they're generally very positive about everything, but I'll know like if they don't mention something or something oh, doesn't yeah. get eaten as quickly, it's like, those are the less popular things. So I have other measures for um, how, how much people are enjoying the, the recipes. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you could have 10 good desserts, but you're going to go for the one that you like, like the most or yeah. And I, I, I think it's something that people aren't even necessarily aware of that they, so I love to kind of observe what people gravitate toward and, and to then kind of like think about that more critically. And is it a chocolate dessert? Is it a fruit dessert? Or like, why isn't someone, why, why maybe isn't someone gravitating toward, you know, a certain dessert? So um, it's very interesting. And I do like to ask a lot of questions about, you know, well, did, did everyone finish their plate? And, you know, did you have leftovers and, and to kind of like do some investigating about how people consumed and enjoyed the, the recipes. Makes sense. Um, so we're getting towards the end of uh, my time to ask you things and then we're going to have some audience questions. Um, so I had a couple of questions I really wanted to get to, so I'm just going to throw those in. Uh, the, the style of the book visually um, is really interesting, both how well the colors pop and also kind of the, the styling of the tables reminds me a lot of older cookbooks in terms of like the tablecloths you pick and what things are where. And so uh -huh. I was really curious how that came together. Yeah. So I started working on a book in the middle of the pandemic and I just felt like it was a time where people were seeking comfort. People, including me, were seeking comfort in, in food. And I, I normally like to find my inspiration for recipes from like being out in the world, like 
going to farmers markets, going traveling, going out to restaurants, bakeries, like seeing what sort of pastry chefs are doing. But I didn't have those same I didn't have those same resources when I was working on this book. So I really turned to texts. I turned to cookbooks of the past by pastry chefs who I admired, who had these long careers. Um, and there was something that really spoke to me about this a kind of nostalgic, like mid-century American kind of style of desserts and, and the kind of nostalgia. It felt very comforting. It felt very familiar. It felt like the kinds of things I wanted to be eating. Um, you know, at a time of uncertainty. And so I really kind of decided like this, these are the kinds of recipes that I want to be making and that I think re would resonate with people because they resonate with me. So I, and I, and I wanted to carry that through with the visuals. Like I, I love the look of cookbooks from the sixties and seventies and even the eighties to some extent. I love old food styling. I love the kind of like retro color palette of, of cookbooks from the seventies and eighties. It's just really fun. And I also felt like, you know, I worked in food media for so long and there is such an emphasis on everything being so kind of tasteful and cool all the time. Mm, like, yeah. you know, everything has to be sort of perfectly artful and arranged. And um, and I was kind of, I wanted to rebel against that a little bit. It's like, not everything has to be so incredibly like of the moment and, and, um, and kind of like on trend. It, I wanted to kind of like go, to, you know, take inspiration from the past and um, lean into these kind of more nostalgic, like color palettes and textures and fabrics and um, and props. So we did try to modernize it. I don't want it to literally look like a cookbook from the seventies because that would not be like it's not the food isn't appealing looking. So I wanted to use like yeah. modern modern food styling and lighting, but pull inspiration from this kind of like retro mid-century 70s kind of look. And so it's just was so fun. And my prop stylist, like her name is Nicole Louie. She totally got it and picked such fun, um, such fun props. So, and this book has a lot of props because a lot of the recipes are, are, are assembled individually. So there's lots of like serving dishes and little individual bowls or ramekins or, or glasses, that kind of thing. And it was just so fun how it all came together. So I just, I wanted it to be colorful and fun and, and have some of the whimsy that I think the recipes have. So it all kind of, I, I saw all of it as one kind of like creative concept, really the, the, the visuals plus the recipes themselves. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's kind of, uh, and a lot of food styling in cookbooks is very restaurant-y. And mm. this book, both in the styling and in the recipe choices, are, is more homey and like, yes. so you can make this at home. It's not like you're trying to replicate something that needs a million pieces of equipment. And... Yeah, everything is, you know, I wanted the recipes to look approachable because if it doesn't look approachable, then it's not going to convince anyone to make it. Um, and I also just was like, I was just tired of, it's like, I just don't want any white marble. Like there's so much food photography yeah. that's like on a perfectly beautiful slab of white marble with a beautiful white linen napkin and like a vintage fork. And it was just like, I'm tired of that look. I just wanted it to be, I don't even care if it's, people don't like it. I just wanted it to be interesting and colorful and fun. And I'm kind of a maximalist when it comes to how I want my recipes to look. Um, so yeah, I just, it's like, all I really want to do is like something different than what I did before and what people are currently doing. So, uh, but, but I think it turned out great. I love, I love how the photos look. Yeah. I like it a lot too. Although I'm not a professional in design or anything. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So the, the last thing I definitely wanted to fit in was uh, a few people at Google messaged me to say they were really excited to see this. And uh, one person had a couple of questions uh, from a young baker named Kenji. Uh, and the first one, I would never have thought to ask, but it's what are your favorite spices? I thought that was a really oh, good question. Yeah. Um, my favorite spices. Well, I don't know if it would technically be a spice. I think it would be, but vanilla. I think vanilla mm. is the most incredible. I think that counts. Yes, like aroma and um, and flavor that you, you know, ever, like you could ever use in um, in baking. So I don't. I do not like vanilla in savory preparations. I hate when that's like a, it's like a scallop of vanilla sauce. Like, I do not, I just don't want to eat that. No, no offense to anyone who does, but I, for sweet, like it's just the most kind of perfumed, incredible. I somehow the term vanilla became synonymous with boring, 
but it's so not. It's the it's when you get like a nice, beautiful, fresh, fragrant vanilla bean. It's just incredible. Um, besides that, I mean, I, I I use like tons of spices in savory cooking. I love certain spice blends. There is this spice blend called um, Vadovan that is um, it's incredible. Um, it's Indian, but it definitely like picks up some French influences. Um, and then, you know, like real cinnamon, not like cassia, but like true cinnamon, um, using the full whole sticks is, is incredible. And just, so it's, I guess it's more about quality, like, you know, finding fresh high quality spices and also replacing your spices, you know, at least once a year because they'll start to get kind of stale. Um, but I love, I love using all sorts of cloves are amazing. Like just the tiniest pinch of clove can make something taste like the holidays. So they're very powerful. Yeah. Um, I love, I love cooking and baking with spices. Cool. Um, yeah, I also really like cloves. It's, I mean, you have to grind them yourself, but the smell is worth it. So, right. I mean, I'll like stick a clove, you know, in a, in a, uh, my, my chef I worked for when I worked in a restaurant used to do this, but stick a clove in an apple and throw it into a, a, a big like vat of chicken stock. Like it's a little bit of that sort of spice in the background is there's ways to employ them in really surprising um, techniques. And um, like, I love card whole cardamom pods. I love whole spices. So they're just, they're versatile and, um, and, and the flavors can be so evocative. So they're, they can be very powerful tools in, in cooking and baking. Um, okay, so it sounds like we have a lot of viewer questions, so let's switch over to those. Uh, uh, okay, so first one comes from Chris Mole. Uh, I apologize to anyone whose name I butcher. Uh, uh, he says, thank you for all the wonderful recipes. Special shout out to those sour cream chive rolls during Thanksgiving. I'm curious, what are your top lesser known but must have baking tools? Yeah. Um, also, I'm very glad, Chris, that you like the sour cream and chive rolls. I did not think that that recipe was going to take off because it's like a little bit more involved, but that is a very, I've, that is a particularly popular Thanksgiving recipe I've noticed. Um, so kitchen tools that are kind of lesser known, but very useful. Um, I guess in the pastry world, it's a little bit of an investment, but something like a turntable can make your life so much easier, like for decorating cake. So like basically literally it's like a, you know, a pedestal that spins. Um, I think those are the kinds of things like worth investing in. Um, things that are a little more like a crepe pan is like kind of obscure and might seem totally pointless, but it's very useful to have a pan with like very low sides for, is essentially like a round griddle. Um, that can be really useful. I use my crepe pan like weirdly like often um, for pancakes or, you know, regular like American style pancakes or um, or any anything where you need to like, you know, a, a side of a pan would, would really kind of get in the way. Um, a couple of fine mesh sieves, those can be really useful. I feel like that is maybe not something that would necessarily occur to someone to have in their kitchen, but like so useful for straining and sifting and, um, you know, straining stock, that kind of thing. Um, a set of good pastry brushes. I mean, these might be things that are not actually necessarily like less, not as appreciated in the kitchen or as common, but are just so useful. So I, I really favor, um, Japanese style pastry brushes because they're just like so well constructed and they don't lose bristles and they're all natural bristle. Those I use constantly and in both um, savory cooking and in, and in baking. So um, having that, a bench scraper, so useful. It's not just for like dividing dough or lifting dough off of the surface. It's great for like, you know, if you're, if you're chopping an onion and you want to get it in the, in the, in the pan or in the pot, like use the bench scraper and just lift everything up and transfer it. So stuff like that, where it's, it's a tool that's so versatile. I mean, of course, like my, my small offset spatula is my number one favorite tool in the kitchen and it's so, so incredibly useful. So um, I'm going to have a lot of kitchen stuff, but there are those kinds of maybe 10 or 12 items that I use more than anything else. And so all, all of those kind of um, are in that category. I might have to look into those Japanese pastry brushes. <laughs> my pastry brush is not very good. The, uh, most pastry brushes are terrible, but the Japanese pastry brushes are phenomenal. So, yes. <laughs> Great. Um, do we have some more questions? Okay. This one is from uh, Shazia Mansuri. How do you stay inspired or find new inspiration? What helps you recharge and come back to your craft re-energized? Great question. Um, I am very inspired by my peers. So I love, like, Instagram is can be a very helpful tool for sort of like seeing what your 
you know, other, other people in your field are doing. And so right now, like what's really inspiring me at the moment is there incredible cake bakers. There's like a cake renaissance happening across the country of like incredible bakers making these layer cakes with the most creative flavors, the most beautiful decoration. And so I just get really inspired by the creativity around me, the creativity of others. And um, that can be, that's very exciting and very kind of charging. I also, as I said, I do like lots of reading of cookbooks and then my, my kind of other tried and true ways of finding inspiration or travel is um, like going somewhere unfamiliar and, uh, you know, starting to learn and understand the flavors and textures that make up a particular cuisine. Um, so I, I haven't traveled in so long or had a really opportunity to do that, but that's really important. Visiting farmer's market, the seasons are a constant source of inspiration. It never gets old to see like new produce come into the farmer's markets. I get excited. It's like when the apples come in and when, then there's quince. And then, you know, in the spring there's like strawberries are the most thrilling thing in the whole world. So every year that's, that's inspiring to me. And that is, it just is, seems like a thing that self renews, you know, I don't have to um, like work to, it doesn't feel like the, the inspiration um, diminishes over over time. So that's really lucky. And then as far as kind of recharging, it's like a big, a big thing that I like to do is just bake for pleasure when I, if I have the time, like make something, find, find an inspiration, whether it's an ingredient or maybe I have a lot of like something left over in my fridge. It's like a lot of times like using up ingredients can lead to creativity. I tend to actually be more creative when I have certain like parameters or, or at least a starting point. Um, and that, that can lead to it. So the idea of being able to bake, but I'm not producing a recipe to, to then, you know, share and disseminate that, that also is, is really fun. And, and I still get like a nice little charge out of that, which is good because I've been doing it for a long time. And it's, it's comforting to know that that's not, that hasn't gone away. Um, yeah, I, I'm also a big fan of farmer's markets. Uh, you just get this rotating cast of things. Yeah. And farmer's markets when you travel in particular, because, you know, you don't have to go too far to have a whole different set of, you know, produce and, and um, you know, fresh fruits or vegetables that, that are exciting. Mm -hmm. um, is there another question? Okay. Here's one from Samantha. How do you organize your personal recipe collection? A collection of cookbooks, note cards, a binder? Yeah, I mean, I have a big cookbook collection. I mean, this is actually not even my personal collection. This is mostly, these are mostly my husband's books. Um, behind me, I have this, there's more, we need to get rid of, I mean, honestly, it's too many, it's too many books to be useful. So, I mean, in so many ways, like my two books are my personal collection of recipes in so many ways. Um, I also have like extensive Google Docs. So I used to, when I was like much, much younger, I used to keep an actual binder of like family recipes. And so the truth is everything's kind of scattered. It's like, I have a certain kind of core group of cookbooks that I turn to over and over again. I have my books, I have family recipes. I have recipes that I've, you know, been working on that are, you know, like live online or, you know, at least like digitally uh, that I can reference. So I don't have like a, a, a particularly impressive, like, way of collecting things. Um, and it's not super organized, but actually it kind of makes me think that like there is a good, that is a good project because oftentimes I'll be like, oh, remember like three years ago, I made that one cake for that one person's birthday. Like, I wonder where that is. And then I have to go, you know, hunt it down and maybe it's in my email somewhere or it's, um, I don't know, like in a Google doc or something. So I think I should do better at <laughs> like get, getting everything together in one, in one place. But, um, the truth is they, you know, some stuff's in print, some stuff is digital. It, it kind of lives in like a lot of different places. Yeah. I've had the same problem. And then finding something you looked up online before is impossible because everything has the same title and. Right. Yes. But like my mom has, has an actual, my mom has her recipe cards in organized in boxes. So sometimes I'll be like, it'll be a recipe that my mom of my mom's that I remember from years ago and she'll go look it up for me and then she'll type it out and send it to me. So it's like there, you know, there's, there's so many ways that these things exist and, uh, and I, but I love a recipe card. Truly. I love a handwritten recipe. I think that's really special. So maybe at some point I'll aspire to like write in my own hand. It's very special to have a recipe written in someone's particular hand that came, that came from them. So I, I love that. Um, so that that's could be a, maybe that's something to aspire to. Yeah. 
Uh, any more questions from the audience? All right, here's one from Lian Sun. She says, hi, Claire, as a recipe tester and creator, what do you do with your baking fails? On one hand, I hate wasting food, but I also hate eating dense gummy cakes. Yeah, I mean, there are, um, sometimes things get thrown out and it's it's a hard thing to avoid and it's but it is very painful so i i'll take i'll take pretty extraordinary measures not to waste ingredients so as i mentioned like my grapes flambe that didn't turn out i just cooked it all down into grape jelly and and had that you know and um i give a lot of stuff away i give a lot of stuff to my neighbors i try not to throw anything out um so I have like kind of a whole network of people who will take stuff. And if like, you know, if I have a, if I have a cake that I underbaked or it's sunk in the middle, I'll just cut out the sunken part, but like the edges will be fine. So I'll cut that into squares. And like, I, I have, um, I keep paper to go boxes at my house because I'll like package up in, you know, little squares of like the outer part of the cake that are still fine. and tastes good, you know, and give those away. So, um, very often something can be repurposed. I so I was baking, I had a wedding cake project that I was working on a couple weeks ago and I had cake scraps um, from that. I was, cause I was trimming the cakes. I was, right, I was yeah. level, leveling them and taking off the dome. So I had cake scraps and I, my husband, we gave them to a friend who made them into cake pops for his kids, like oh, birthday party. Like, so it's, it's, we try to get creative with it. And my husband is also a kind of master repurposer of ingredients and, um, and recipes. So we've, a lot of the creativity is spent like turning something into something else, but a lot of it's just given away. And, you know, I, I do, when I give stuff away, I'll often say to people, oh, this didn't really turn out or like this is, wasn't supposed to happen or I, you know, I accidentally did this or whatever. And you know what? No one even cares. Like, I'm sure there's someone who will eat that gummy dense cake if you like, if you look hard enough. So um, yeah, I think like one person's failure is not necessarily another person's failure. So you can usually find someone who will be happy to take it. Um, and that's what I try to do. That sounds nice. I don't think I have <laughs> quite the circle of uh, people with all sorts of tastes, but yeah, it, <laughs> just cutting out the bad parts is certainly a, a technique. Yeah, I've used yeah. Before. Cut off, cut off the bad part, and give and tell, and don't even tell, mention it to anyone. They won't, they won't know. That's so true. Yeah. A lot of times, people won't even know. Great. Um, can we get the next question, please? This is from Danielle. Uh, how would you recommend someone transition from baking by following recipes to creating their own recipes? Yeah, I think that's a great question. I think that it's a natural progression for people, for avid bakers to to go from following recipes to kind of like riffing and then, you know, creating their own eventually. So I think it's about finding base recipes that you really, really like and then understanding certain principles of like what will work and what will work. So, you know, you can kind of find there's there's to, to a to a limited extent, there's kind of rules of thumb for adapting a recipe. So it's like, oh, did you, you know, if you make a recipe and with all purpose flour and you want to put in a little whole wheat flour, it's like, okay, so generally speaking, you can get away with substituting 25% whole wheat flour. And so it's kind of about learning the rules and when you can bend them to your own, you know, to, to sort of adapt something to your own tastes. So, and a lot of it is understanding moisture and it's kind of the, the, the sort of general principles of baking. So it's like, if you're adding a ton of moisture to a recipe in some form or another, like that's going to throw things off and understanding things like leavening. So if you're making a cake, for instance, um, sort of, so having an understanding of the techniques, I think is really important. Like, why are you doing what you're doing? Why are you creaming together the butter and sugar? Why are you adding room temperature eggs to the mixture? Um, and once you have that kind of understanding, then you have a better idea of, 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 of how changes will affect the recipe. So, you know, if you have a really great kind of like yellow cake recipe that you love or an olive oil cake, you can play around with turning that into a layer cake or an upside down cake. You know, if you have um, like uh, a, a cake recipe that you really like you and you understand that like if you bake it as in cupcakes, you're going to bake faster. Like, the, you know, those are ways that you can sort of take recipes that you've made before that that you know turn out that you like and tweak them and adapt them to sort of your own tastes um and like your you know your design your the sort of format and those types of things so i mean you might encounter like outcomes that you didn't 
anticipate when you start to change things and to develop your own. Um, but generally speaking, like it's very rare for a recipe developer to start from actual zero when they're creating a recipe and to like pull things out of thin air. So it's like, you're usually starting from a base recipe. So when I developed my chocolate chip cook recipe, like that had evolved from, you know, years and years of tweaking, but I started with a chocolate chip cook recipe. I, I started somewhere and I don't even remember where it was, but it was like at a, with a cookie that I had made in the past that I really liked or that kind of thing. So take those recipes, decide what you want to change about them and start changing. And I also, I recommend not changing too many things at once because you change too many variables and it doesn't turn out, you don't know why. So, you know, change one or two things at a time until you kind of get to where you like it. And hopefully along the way, you, you know, you're still getting outcomes that like, you know, you, you will enjoy. So, um, yeah, it's just kind of, you just kind of take baby steps. Um, okay. I was going to talk about substituting for allergies, but we only have time for two more questions. So let's just <laughs> get the, the listeners instead of me asking you things. Okay. Uh, so this is from Estefania. Uh, how often are fussy recipe steps actually necessary? For example, transferring dough to a fresh bowl to rise. I love how you promote sustainability in vids and prefer less dishes when possible. Yeah, I mean, I can't speak for other recipe writers, um, but generally speaking, because of my focus on streamlining and like, I don't want to do a lot of dishes either. I, if there is a, and I say this in the book, if there is in my own recipes, if there is a, a step that I'm telling you to do, there's a reason behind it. So that example of like transferring dough into a clean bowl, it depends on what you mean by necessary. I mean, like, it could be that it's going to rise better in that cl clean bowl. It could be that you might have stuck on bits of, you know, flour around the bowl that are going to cling to the dough. And then you're going to have like little lumps in your dough. So it's like, I, generally speaking, especially if it's a technique that you see over and over and over again, there's generally a reason behind it. So I am all about you know, fewer dishes, but I actually think like the, and my, my focus on sustainability is more about single use things that get thrown out. It's like, I think when it comes to dishes, like, you know, I cram my dishwasher fill, like I, I fill it like crazy to try, you know, try to maximize like efficiency. Um, so when it comes to sustainability, I think like I prefer to focus more on like replacing single use plastic and aluminum foil and parchment paper and those kinds of things you're going to throw out aren't going to actually generate waste. Whereas if it's a step that's going to like, maybe you have one more bowl to wash, it feels um, like more acceptable to me, I guess. So I guess when it comes to my own recipes, if there's a step that seems fussy, believe me, I tried it. I'm sure I feel like it's fussy too. And it means that I tried it without doing it and it didn't work. So that's why it's there. Um, again, I can't really speak for others. I do think that there are recipe developers who just think like, this is the way things are supposed to be done. So this is how I'm going to, you know, tell people to do it as well. And that may, might not be, you, you might be able to cut things out. But um, again, if it's a technique that like is you see over and over and over again, there it's a re there's a reason for that, I think. Makes sense. I, I'm also a dishwasher crammer. I have two kids, so otherwise we'd be doing <laughs> dishes every single day. Right. Um, we have time for one last question, which is from Megan. And it's, what is your favorite thing to make for a New Year's celebration? Yeah, great question. I love New Year's desserts because I love thinking of something that's like super celebratory. So my favorite recipe, one of my favorite recipes in the book, um, and it might even be it might be the very first recipe in the book, is the last several years for New Year's Eve, I've made a champagne jelly. So people have very strong opinions about jelly desserts. I actually really like them. Um, I did make it for a friend a couple years ago who strongly disliked does not like oh. the texture of jelly desserts. So I was like, well, sorry, you're not going to, it's the second recipe actually. So champagne jelly to me, it's so elegant. It's like, I don't know. It just seems, it's also kind of light and it's like on yeah. New Year's, it's like maybe you've, you've like had a big dinner or like you're just, you know, generally like want to keep it or, or you're not trying to be down for the count after like a super heavy dessert or something. It's like you're staying yeah. up until past midnight. So, um, and I combine it with grapefruit. So here's the recipe in the book. It is my, so it's the second recipe. It's called, it's my French 75 jelly. So it's basically a champagne jelly. You make this kind of um, gin based syrup because like a French 75 is a, is a champagne cocktail that has gin and lemon in it. So you use all the same ingredients and you make this 
you use like a, a rosé sparkling wine and you like it's goes really easy it comes together super fast you ch chill it you know if you can 12 hours in advance and then you you take grapefruit which i love grapefruit it's such an amazing citrus it's perfect for winter because that's like when grapefruit when citrus are in season and you cut away all the peel and pith you there's a section in the book that explains how to do this how to cut sort of they're called suprems how to cut you know individual segment of citrus and you just like layer them in glasses and you don't have to there's nothing fussy about it you literally just put the grapefruit in scoop some of the jelly on top it kind of it doesn't it's not a very strong set so it like kind of naturally you know kind of like fills the glass and it's so elegant i made this i had my book party last week and i made this and people like freaked out about it they loved it so it's to me so elegant easy you can make it ahead perfect for the holiday because it has you know sparkling wine in it and and really good so yeah that was perfect great i might have to make that my wife loves jelly desserts so oh good yes yes i love them too <laughs> um so i think we're out of time um uh, i know we could just keep going because there's a lot of interesting stuff in this book uh but we have to wrap up so thank you for coming and speaking with us um and i don't really need to plug your book because I'm sure everyone's <laughs> heard of it already, but just in case uh, the book is available now and is called What's for Dessert and your YouTube channel is called uh, Dessert Person and is also great. Um, anything else you want to add before we cut? No, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for all of the great questions and happy holidays. <laughs> happy baking. Yeah. Happy holidays, everybody. Great. Thanks.